Anthony. Yes, uh, Ms. Ward, just out of curiosity, which hospital were your children treated at? They've been treated in several. We were living in Dallas when the children were born, and so then we moved the to NICU, Chicago. The NICU, the NICU bill sounds like it was the most. Wh wh which, which hospital was the NICU in? Um, they were both at Baylor in yeah. Dallas, and then also okay. at Children's Medical Center. Sounds good. Dr. Messick, uh, you, I assume the patient you described was treated at Brigham. Brigham's a nonprofit. They get disproportionate share, and it's a 340B hospital. All three are mechanisms by which it's supposed to help those who cannot pay their bills be alleviated from the burden. Do you know if Brigham ever reached out to those patients to help decrease their cost? I, I should be clear, the patient I was talking about was uh, at Rhode Island where I did my residency training, so not in the Brigham so system. Rhode Island, if it's an academic center, typically those are nonprofit. So that would again have 340B and a tax exempt status. Did that hospital, uh, and by the way, did that hospital, as far as you know, have a program? Or does Brigham? Let me ask about Brigham. Yeah. Do they have a program where if somebody comes in uninsured or poorly insured or with a high deductible to help offset the cost of that bill? Yes, uh, Mass General Brigham does have that policy. If up to 150% of the federal poverty level gets free care, up to 300% gets discounted care, all hospitals have to have. So in a sense, that mechanism is then working. Dr. Chino, what a motivating, what a t motivation for you, but what a terrible story for us about your husband. Sloan Kettering, again, it's a nonprofit, 340B, and a disproportionate share, big, big, big disproportionate share state. Does Sloan Kettering have a program where they pass the 340B discount to the patient? We are not a 340B program at Memorial Sloan Kettering. I think you are. I looked it up, and I think I saw that you are. Okay. Uh, that is news to me. I apologize. Um, but I will say that our charity care program is actually quite robust. But we they, actually... But do they pass that? Because you mentioned specifically the cost of drugs. Do they pass that 340B discount to, to the we patient? We cover up to 500% of FPL for our charity care program, which is uh, far more than we need to. So is, that so... for the, is that for the uninsured, or would that include the people with a, a, a less generous insurance policy? Up to 500% of FPL, yes. So, so in that sense, the programs we have would, would address that, that portion of medical debt that would be at Jaws Hospitals. That's important. It's important, but you also have to realize that in New York City, even up to 500 FPL is, is not necessarily a livable wage. And I know that sounds insane. Um, and when you think about a charity curriculum, for example, for my husband, he was underinsured, but he was also a college professor. So we did not meet any actual charity care now program. He, and yet we still fell into massive debt now, related to his he would, have, he would have been below 500% of FPL if he was... Um, he was not treated at Memorial Sloan Kettering. Got it. And the hospital he was treated, was that a 340B nonprofit? I apologize. I do not know that, sir. Okay. Uh, do you know the name of the hospital? He was treated at the University of Michigan initially. Well, that would have been a three, yeah, that would have been a 340B nonprofit. Dr. Bai, what we have here, at least in a couple of cases, may be cases where a 340B nonprofit receiving disproportionate chair dollars is not helping people with their medical expense. Uh, uh, is that a... Um, um, uh, and, I, and as it turns out, my staff just tells me that Baylor is also a 340B hospital nonprofit. So theoretically, we have hospitals which are supposed to be doing the right thing, and they're not doing the right thing. Uh, what, I guess it's not a market failure, but it's certainly a failure of a hospital to act in a way which would be consistent with that was intended by the, by the policymaker. Any comment on that? I, think that's, I believe that's exactly what the policymakers are trying to do. All these policies are in favor of large players, in my opinion, trying to build a coalition between the policymakers and the large players. So large players will just ignore what the patient needs and focus their effort on this influencing, capturing the regulatory process, the legislative process. So they got the best benefit, like more 340B, right? More uh, site-based payments. So they would, act, they would act for more subsidy, but yet we have exactly. clear instances of that subsidy not being passed to the patient. I, two things about your um, testimony. You said only 14% of people have a medical debt over 10 k in my statement, I mentioned that 50% of medical debt is related to hospital expense. So really, if these policies were, were actually implemented as intended, it would have a very positive impact. Dr. Ippolito, uh, real quickly, I'm almost out of time. The No Surprises Act was supposed to eliminate surprise medical billing, and that was a major cause of medical debt. Has there been an analysis of the accrual of medical debt subsequent to the passage of the No Surprises Act? Not that I'm aware of, but in theory, it should have helped. 
Yeah, uh, the, certainly the testimony we received at the time was a lot of medical debt was related to, I thought you were in network, turns out you weren't. Uh, and now No Surprises addresses that. Maybe that will be a policy that actually works. Uh, Mr. Chair, I may have a second round, but I'll yield right now.